we are here to uncover the good, the bad, and the ugly of the IT industry. My name is Robin Johns, and this is Convergence by Cato Networks. It's 2022, and you can't open your LinkedIn or read a news article without some mention of the, the Great Resignation. The Great Resignation shows no sign of slowing down, and in fact may be ramping up. According to a recent survey from Microsoft, 52% of Gen Z and Millennials are considering joining the Great Reshuffle. This is up 3% from 2021. 35% of Gen X and Baby Boomers are also thinking about a job change in 2022. And with low levels of happiness reported by working IT professionals, putting IT in the bottom 43% according to an ongoing survey of millions by Career Explorer, CIOs should take this statistic seriously. On this episode, we are hosting Brandon O'Dell and Nick Holden, Cato Network's talent acquisition partners, located both in the US and UK. We'll talk about why talented people in tech are quitting their jobs, what are the best incentives, and how to adapt the company culture to welcome the elusive Gen Z. Stay tuned, folks. This should be a fun one. Hi, Nick. Hi, Brandon. Thank you for joining me today. How are you both doing? I'm good, thanks, Robin. I'm good. Sun shining, so can't complain. Wonderful. What about yourself, Brandon? Doing well here. How are you, Robin? Life is good. Life is good. So let's start with a big wide range and I'll, I'll start with you, Brandon. Who are you and what do you do? My name is Brandon O'Dell. I work here on the talent team at Cato Networks. I've been recruiting in the security space for almost seven or eight years and seen a lot of change over that time and excited to talk about some market trends with you today. Fantastic. And same question to you, Nick. Who are you? What do you do? And an additional question, how did you get here? <laughs> Great question. So, yeah, Nick Holden, um, based out of the UK, currently responsible for, for kind of building the Cato team across um, Amir and APJ. Similar to Brandon, being in cyber for about six or seven years, what brought me here today was getting headhunted by my manager, is the open honest question, uh, Robin, or answer, I should say. Um, so, yeah, but no, you know, sold the dream and decided to try and take him up on that dream. That sounds good. The realm of talent acquisition is all about identifying the right people, selling that dream, driving that dream, and making dreams come true to a bigger, brighter, better future. And not to sell, but Cato has lots of opportunities out there. If you're interested, if you're listening, catonetworks.com slash careers. So on the topic of new jobs, new roles, new ideas, if you've looked at the media, if you looked at any of the press, the newspapers, the websites, you'll notice that people keep banding around the term of great resignation. The idea of a great depression, that's old hat now. And people are all talking about the idea of that great resignation. What is it? And what caused this great resignation? Yeah, I think the great resignation has always been there. Um, it's not a new phenomenon. It's not suddenly something that's cropped up over the last two years. What I think has escalated it has been COVID. You know, we had a lot of people that were very reluctant to change roles in a, an uncertain period that you know many people had not seen in their lifetimes. So I think once that was over, people kind of said, okay, now I can look elsewhere, I can change my job. And I think that's what kind of kicked it off. And we've seen that over the past 18 months to two years with people more open to, to changing roles. So do you think it was just COVID that escalated people's willingness to resign? Or do you think there were other facts that was... Uh causing the transition? I think COVID played a factor, but I think really 13 years of a hot candidate market and a good tech increase in jobs put people in a position where the supply and demand for talent drove a candidate market. People don't quit jobs when they know they can't find another one. And right now they have lots of opportunities coming to them. And if they see at their current role that they're not getting what they want, whether it's remote, options or benefits or whatever it may be, they're willing to just say goodbye and I'll go find something better. So why do good people in well-paid tech roles actually decide to up and leave? Um, great question. You know, you get the, the promise of the grasses being greener on the other side. It can be true. It cannot be true as well. But I think, you know, people like to experience different cultures, different um, environments, 
it's become a lot more apparent now that you have to work a lot harder to retain your staff. So some organizations, they don't take that as seriously as what they should do. So having the, the amount of opportunities, and as Brandon alluded to, it's a very candidate-driven marketplace at the moment. So the, the number of options that are there for candidates is, is quadrupled, even more than that. Each candidate you speak with has three, four options on the table when they're considering changing roles. Okay, so it sounds like it's very hot out there. So if you have multiple different companies all vying for the same candidate and all vying for the same metaphorical pound of flesh to join the, the organizations, what recommendations do you have to get people through the door? As if you have four or five people all baying for the same role, how can you differentiate? How can you gain that attention of that ideal candidate and say, yes, we are the shining star. You should follow us. I think part of it is having what they're looking for. And people right now, the list is longer than ever. In the past, you could ask someone and they may have one or two asks out of a new role or a new company. But now it's almost a 10 minute conversation on what they're looking for and what they want. It could be career progression, abilities to grow, great tech, great culture, awesome manager, salary, benefits, perks, like that conversation is extensive now. So the way to attract them in a noisy market is to, to offer as many of those check boxes as possible and then really sell them on what they have to gain in the new role. Don't tell them something that's not true, but obviously, uh, <laughs> you know, show them the path of where they can get career progression or abilities to grow through training, which Robin knows a ton about. That's, I think, what uh, is getting people in the door at Cato and other top companies. Just following on top of that, you know, candidates aren't necessarily applying to roles anymore. It's a lot about headhunting, about attracting them. So, you know, we do a great job here at Cato from a kind of employee brand perspective. So, you know, talking about that, making sure we're visible in the market to when candidates kind of say, oh, I'm going to look for a new role. I've seen Cato, I'll apply. And then when we have those conversations, they're warm conversations. So that's a big thing as well, which we do very well here. Okay. So question for you, Nick, if I was a recruiter or somebody in talent acquisition, and I was looking for an ideal candidate for a role, what are the general places you would look? What are the, the skills you would search for? How as a person can I get noticed in the market? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. You know, LinkedIn, they've kind of cornered the market when it comes to talent acquisition, because it's a social platform where you can sell yourself without selling yourself as such. So this is talent acquisition. You know, we, we speak to the hiring managers. We are looking to what attributes, what technical skills the team are looking for, but then also looking at the soft skills as well. So the technical attributes there, they're easy to put on LinkedIn. So, you know, show certifications, so target achievements if you're sales, show the kind of relevant technologies that you're working in. And then when it comes to the softer skills, you know, making sure simple things as like grammar on your LinkedIn is, is correct. That's a big thing. Unfortunately, hiring managers look at that very, very well. I've had candidates in the past who, you know, they've had poor grammar in their CV and the hiring managers pulled them out. They've still got hired, but it creates that that little bit of bias from the hiring manager's point of view when they first see it. They actually know this candidate can't pick up this, so they don't pay attention to detail. So it's little things like that. So making yourself stand out in that crowded marketplace is key and making sure that on LinkedIn, for example, you've got your attributes, your technical skills, making sure they're visible. So you're saying if I have a CV with a skill of attention to detail, make sure I spell the word detail correctly. Yeah. Or you can go the other route and yeah, you can purposefully spell things incorrectly to get people's attention. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that might not be the recommended approach. If you've got a CV, you call it a CV and not a resume because it's only in the US they call it resumes. Ah, so are you seeing the same on your side, Brandon? Recruiting for the, the Americas region, recruiting for the other side of the pond to myself and Nick, what sort of skills or what sort of standouts would you recommend that people do to get noticed? I think looking for a job ends up turning into sales and marketing. And that's easy if you're in sales and marketing. But if you're an engineer, that's not naturally maybe one of your skill sets or your strengths. So, you know, I always tell people when they're, especially if they're out of work and looking for a job, that it's a full-time job and you have to treat it that way and kind of pick up some skills that maybe aren't in your strength when it comes to getting yourself out there, networking, talking to people, and then of course, having a profile that's interesting and highlighting your experience in the right way. It's very difficult. It's very hard. 
If you are an extroverted person, if you're in sales, marketing, if you're in recruitment, your job is to talk to people. And all day, every day, you are talking, you are engaging, you are interacting, but you might not be focused on some of the more introspective qualities. Now, from my own experiences, the majority of engineers, developers, DevOps, SRE, kind of the nerds of the world, and I say that as myself, we are generally more introverted. And when it comes to hyping yourself up, getting yourself noticed, saying, these are my fantastic achievements, it feels very weird, it feels very foreign, and the imposter syndrome runs wild and strong. The best developers I know, they think they're terrible developers because 90% of their code comes from Stack Overflow, copy and pasted. But the true intelligence comes from knowing what exactly to copy and paste and what it does. Or if you don't know what it does, at least how to hide the bugs and then blame the junior dev or the person that worked behind you. So if I was an engineer and I wanted to get a little bit of self-confidence to get headhunted by somebody, are there any small recommendations that you would suggest I do? Just, just very, very minor ones. And I'll target that at you, Brandon. A lot of times when we interview technical folks, they have really exciting experience, but you have to pull it out of them. So I think them kind of looking at what they've actually accomplished or created in their career with a sense of pride and being able to say, you know what, this project actually turned out really good and my company and my manager were happy about it. I should highlight that. Because when we ask them, they're like, ah, you know, I did this, I did that, it was okay. <laughs> but in the end, they created amazing things. Like what we have at Cato, they created that. And I bet if you asked some of them, they would just be like, oh, well, it needs this, or I have to improve on this, or this could be better. And they don't really focus on how far they've come sometimes. So just kind of stopping for a moment, realizing and hi highlighting that experience is what I would recommend. But the self-criticality, the constant desire to improve, the constant push to make yourself better than the day before, that's what keeps people going and that keeps driving that, that approach. But I like that you mentioned confidence because confidence is often closely equated with ego. And some folks see people that are overly vivacious and confident and loud and think they're stupid because they're loud. Now, that's kind of a little dovetail. I'm not going to go too deep down that path. But ego does play a very large part into people's career development because titles directly tie to progress. So question for you, Nick, when you're hiring, are you identifying that better salaries or interesting positions slash title? What is the driver? What gets people's attention most? Yeah, I think it depends on a num number of factors. You know, Culturally and kind of geographically, we have some regions that are more focused on the title, more focused on the career development. We have some areas that are more focused on the on the salary, for example. And I think a large part of it comes down to a is you know where is that person in their career at the moment? What are they looking for as their next steps? I speak to many candidates that often say, "Oh, first call, it's not about the salary. I, I don't care about the salary." Um, and then you get later on, and oh, actually, it's all about the salary. So it's about understanding that um, and. You know, people have their own motivations for, for taking a career change. And I think it's about being honest with yourself. And, you know, us as recruiters, we're not here to, to try and catch people out. We're not trying to here to get the best deal for Cato because we can find someone that's $100,000 under, under budget. It's not about that. Look, people will pay market value if you think you're worth it. Um, and, you know, kind of going back to confidence is the biggest thing. And being able to, to talk to yourself, be honest with yourself and say, look, I'm going to make a move. This is what I need. This is what I can feel comfortable with. But yeah, if, you know, some people are truly motivated by title alone, and some are purely motivated on salary. So are you seeing similar in the US, Brandon? Like Nick said, it's, it's case to case. You know, you'll come across a candidate who's been trying to get that manager title for two years, and they weren't able to get it in their current role. And that's what's really driving them. They know that's the next step that they need to get where they want to be. And that's really important to them at that time. But generally, I think you could almost draw like a circle diagram of overlap of the things that people want. And again, there's a lot of boxes and they're going to look at an overall opportunity for what's going to put them in a better place. Salary is a huge part of that and it's really competitive. So in this type of market, people aren't taking pay cuts generally. You know, they're looking for a step up and they're not going to settle for less than that, even if they feel like the opportunity is really exciting. 
How about people just entering into the workplace? There's no denying that the Gen Zs and the millennials are now effectively running the, the next wave of people in the market. So if you've just come straight out of university, or if you only have a couple of years experience into the belt, are you seeing the same level of salary expectation and desire as you would for somebody in their late 40s, early 50s? I think even more so, maybe. You know, they have really high expectations of their worth, maybe even an inflated version of that sometimes. And there's so much information available to them that wasn't in the past. First of all, people talk about compensation. It used to be really taboo, but now I think people are open to having a discussion about it with their peers. Then there's Glassdoor, Fishbowl, uh, RepView. There's so much information for them to say, this is what the market gets for this type of position. And if they see that, that's what they want. They feel like they deserve it and they're not going to settle for less. That transparency is both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> it's a blessing to promote worker fairness, salary equality, and get people having those discussions to make sure your employers are treating you fair. But if I was a fresh grad and I went on levels.fyi and was, was seeing what a you know, level six Google senior associate fellow is getting, I would start thinking, yes, that is achievable. I'll point this one at you, Nick. Do you see many candidates, especially younger or junior candidates, being unrealistic with junior entry level roles? Uh, yeah, is, is the short answer. And I think that's where it comes back down to the recruiter to level those expectations because it's okay saying, I want this really high salary, but A, do you have the skills and experience that go alongside that salary? And B, do you have the ability to achieve that? Because if we turn this on sales, for example, if you're getting a large amount of OTE, then you're expected to hit a, a big target. You're not going to get a million dollar OTE and then have a, a fifty thousand pound a year target, are you? So it's it's kind of swings and roundabouts, and I think that's the same way for tech, for example, that you've got to be able to understand. Yes, a role may pay that, but do you come with the necessary experience, and are you going to be able to perform that role up to that level? And I think that's an important conversation for us as recruiters to have. You know, it's about setting expectations on the salary, but also expect, setting expectations on the role requirements. It's a key element of what we do. As talent acquisition, you're effectively the key masters and the gatekeepers to a company's success. If you have a strong pipeline established for roles and you identify the best candidates and criterias, well, the company will grow faster and more rapidly. So in doing your initial candidate vetting and setting your expectations, you also need to start looking at culture and personalities. So what sort of personality assessments, tests, or vetting do you do on your initial calls? And I'll start with Brandon. I think a lot of it is, again, going back to what people are looking for and what they want. If they value diversity, if they value you know, a good manager and a collaborative work environment, those are going to come up throughout the process naturally. They're going to highlight those things, examples of when they've done that, examples of when they wanted that, or you know, examples where they're leaving because they didn't get that. And those obviously resonate here at Cato. And when Nick and I hear those examples, we smile a little bit because we know pretty quickly if someone's going to fit in or not based off of how they operate, how they answer those questions. So I think it's a total picture. It may not be that we're just driving at one thing because it's more than one thing that makes a culture. But by the end, uh, we can tell when someone's going to be fit in at Cato pretty well, I think. So that's interesting. You mentioned then if they'll fit in with a culture. Culture at a company is a very organic, living, growing thing. Any company that tries to force a culture generally doesn't have a culture. <laughs> it's not something you can automatically force. So if I was a recruiter, if I was somebody that worked in human resources or similar, and I was finding it hard to bring in young, fresh talent, what advice would you give to me to help shape my corporate culture to meet the needs of the Gen Z, Gen X, millennials of this world? What I've learned about that generation is really what they want. And what they want the most is career progression and learning. And a company that cares about those things looks at where they stand in it and says, here's what we need to do to make those better. I know we've invested a lot in learning and development since I've been here. So that's one checkbox ticked. And then on the career progression side, I think probably that's an area we could improve. 
for the Gen Z within our company. And I'm sure that we're looking at that and planning on improving that over time. So would you say having a consistent learning and development and L&D plan is the best incentive to keep talent within a corporation or are there better ways to retain talent? There's no right or wrong answer when it comes to retaining talent. You've got to look at what's important to your team, to your culture. So what, what might be important to your kind of L&D team, uh, Robin, may be very different to our sales organization, for example. Each part of the team is going to have different motivators. So I think it's about you know utilizing tools that are on the marketplace to you know stay in tune um, to what the business is looking for, and that culture really starts from the top. So you know CEO down have to be all talking the same type of culture. The best organizations that I've worked in with a good culture, in inverted brackets, is you know somewhere that is is, is open, it's engaging, it's being driven from the CEO. It's not a HR initiative, it's not a recruitment initiative, it's it's a leadership initiative. And that's the biggest thing. And then taking the time to listen to your employees on an individual basis, but also on a team basis and saying, look, you know, to keep this team happy, we have to do X and to keep this team happy, we have to do Y. But obviously that's not scalable. So trying to keep it in a way that encompasses everyone and listens to as many people as possible. I've heard that one of the most profound reasons people leave a company is often because of their manager instead of the actual role itself. But there's quite a few things happening in the global macroeconomic climate currently, which are leading to quite a few people being forcibly pushed out. Websites like thelayoff.com and others seem to be going through a period of growth currently, as unfortunately, people seem to be being made redundant and corporations are downsizing or going through hiring freezes. So how do you think this global situation is going to play out over the next 12 months? Um... <laughs> I don't think it's going to improve. You know, I think there's going to be more kind of storms before the, the weather brightens up a little bit because, you know, we're, we're seeing now a lot of organizations cutting back or hiring freezes, for example. And I think, you know, until the market understands what's going on in the world and, and reacts to that efficiently, then unfortunately, I think there will be more layoffs and it's about how people react. So, you know, we've kind of talked about early banking yourself as, as attractive as possible to your employer. And I think it's also from the employer's point of view as well, it's not holding those layoffs against people. You know, we've we've come out of a, a kind of climate of COVID into the kind of potential recession we find ourselves in now where people may have gaps in their CV where they haven't worked for six months through no fault of their own. So it's about removing that bias as a manager, taking the time to, to kind of have that conversation and understand why people are in that situation. So as the quantity of candidates available in the market is, as you mentioned, predicted to increase, do you think this will reflect on the total overall compensation packages people are asking for? As you mentioned earlier, it's very much an employee's market currently, where people can ask for inflated salaries, whether they have inflated sense of self-worth or they're just trying to keep up with established amounts. Do you see overall comp packages changing over this next 12 to 18 months? I think it depends on how long it goes on and how many people remain on the market. It's an odd market right now because you have the hottest 12-year stretch of hiring, followed by COVID where people still continued to hire even though people were hesitant for maybe a couple months. And then you have these questions about a recession now. So I think it's hot and cold at the same time, which is probably the first time I've ever seen this <laughs> in my career. and. I don't predict that hiring is going to slow down. I mean, there's companies that have 200, 300 positions that have been open for several months. Even the people coming on the market aren't going to be enough to fill those. They're not going to be enough to fill the increased demand between now and what they're projecting for the, you know, between now and 2025, which it's doubling and tripling in the tech space. So my thoughts is no, it's not going to affect the salary of the market enough with the layoffs. And I think even some of these companies that have layoffs are gonna to continue to hire in other departments. And then after six or eight, 10 months, if the recession doesn't hit very hard, we'll be hiring again. I think during this period of uncertainty, companies should look forward to condensing the amount of services and vendors they have. They should look at simplifying their overheads and try and reduce their operational costs. So maybe look for vendors that can do multiple items rather than one and 
try and find ways to simplify their entire operational day-to-day runnings. And there's several companies out there to do them, one of which is Kato, but I'm not here to talk to you and sell to you because, heck, you recruit the people who make the dream happen. But it's a pretty scary market out there. As you've mentioned, we've had a 12-year hot streak, and the world of tech is booming and bigger and better than ever. But the global situation of our markets at the moment has a lot of people scared. And believe me, just don't look at the crypto markets either, unless you want to cry yourself to sleep. Just pretend it doesn't exist. Crypto markets are bad. So during this time of uncertainty, how do we keep employees happy? How do we keep our internal teams smiling and feeling like their jobs are secure when there's so much question marks just out there in the the wild? How do we keep people happy? I think, like you said, you know, there could be a consolidation and our strategy feels like we could reap the benefits of that. If the market does go south, we could be positioned well. And that's something that people want to know. They want to know that our company is stable, that it has a good strategy in place that there's money in the bank for a rainy day and that we're going to continue growing because our market is going to continue growing. Our leadership publicly has talked about how companies shouldn't be consolidating right now because it's still going to be growth. And they also continued to grow during COVID when a lot of people said, we're going to slow down. They said, we're going to speed up. So they've shown a track record of you know, making it through tough times and making the right decisions. And I think not only do they say the right things, but they've shown that they'll do the right things. And that gives people a sense of security of the future. Security of the future is something that everybody wants. Sadly, we're not in a position anymore where there's jobs for life and roles that offer final salary pensions are few and far between, which is a little bit different to how it was in the 70s. Hopefully they'll make a comeback at some point in the future, but I'm not going to hold my breath. I think that's kind of of a bygone era. So when it comes to acquiring talent, say you've, you have an open role, you've scoured LinkedIn, you found the ideal candidate, you've reached out. How often do those leads go cold? Are you having the majority of your leads come back with a response or do you feel like you're shouting into the void the majority of the time? Shouting into the void is a, is a good word to use. As recruiters, we, we sometimes have to be pests. As I'm pretty sure you've encountered in the past, Robin, where you get 50 messages from a recruiter. <laughs> and there's only so many ways you can say no. Yeah, quite frequently I get messages saying, hey, do you want to be a Java developer? We have a short six-month position. It's like, oh, I'll ignore that one again. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think you'd be a good Java developer, Robin, so you shouldn't put yourself out the, uh, out the window all the time. But no, you know, it's about understanding, is, is having the, the conversation with the right level of candidates. You've alluded to there, you know, from a recruitment point of view, it's about being very specific with our targeted messaging only reaching out to people from from what we can see would fit the vacancy the role could be of interest to them and making sure that we're going to them with something that we feel as a recruiter is is, you know going to be of interest candidates quickly get turned off when they hear something that's you know is way outside of their out of their experience out of their comfort zone on top of that is the networking side brandon alluded to it earlier you know us as recruiters, when we have a, de- a role come above on top of our desk, we know pretty quickly the types of candidates we want, the types of candidates we know, and who we can reach out to. So it's about building that network. And on the flip side, you know, from candidates' point of view, it, I always recommend having two or three recruiters in your network. You're not speaking to them every day. You're not having a cup of coffee with them every single day. But you you know, if something were to happen, you know the people to go to who are who know you as a person as as a as an employee, and we'll be able to help you pretty swiftly. Yeah, I've always kind of wondered that. So if I was somebody looking for a job and there was a company that I wanted to work for, but they didn't have an open position that suited me, do people in talent acquisition like it when strangers reach out and say, hey, here are my skills and abilities. Let me know if you have a role that opens up. Is that generally liked or do you dislike it when people do that? I personally like it, you know. My job is to talk to people, as you alluded to earlier, you know. Strangely enough, my, my wife would probably disagree, but I, I like talking to people. I'm always open to having conversations, be that with experienced people or be that with people who are just starting out in their careers. You know, I'm always happy to offer guidance or you know, offer support when it comes to, to CV or LinkedIn, just to kind of you know, help people in, in the cybersecurity space. Because at the end of the day, it's always about paying it forward and helping someone else. Because 
unfortunately, some of us will always be on a time of need at some point. Okay, question for you then, Brandon. I apply for a role. Should I include a picture of myself in my resume? I'll use the American term. Should I have a picture of myself in the resume? Should I upload a video resume? What's your preferred style? I think you want whatever a person submits to be a reflection of themselves. So if that means video, great. If you feel confident about that, do that. If that means you don't want to show a picture, don't show a picture and kind of every flavor of that. So uh, my style is I want you to be you and feel comfortable in that and be authentic. And then the rest will kind of fall into place. That's a very optimistic and lovely way of looking at the world. The old statement, you be you because everybody else is taken. I like that. Love the skin you're in. Very positive message you've got. Good vibes, good vibes. So if I was to reach out to you folks and say, hey, I've seen this fantastic role. It's brilliant. I think I have all of the prerequisites, but I don't really have the industry experience. You've asked for 10 years of usage in this tool. I have two years. Is that an automatic discount and shutdown, or is there still an opportunity that you might sneak through the door? Sneak through the door is a is an interesting term. I'd always be open to having conversations with people, even if there's a a small kind of match on the on the, the skill requirements. It's always you know, that person could be the next big thing when it comes to that given job. Um, so I, I I never close any doors. All right. I guess I'll start applying for heart surgeon roles and see what terms that make. <laughs> I might be lucky. I've got shaky hands and no medical experience, but I'll fake it until I make it. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> kind of goes back to our, our previous point about confidence. When you're applying for a role, it can be very disheartening. You're putting your entire life on the line and you're selling yourself as a product. So when I bear my soul, I bear my all and say, hey, Brandon, here I am. Here's my experiences. Here's my skills. Here I am. And I don't get the role. How do you go back to that candidate and how do you make them feel like they've put the effort in, but it's not ready for them? How do you deliver that message without breaking their heart and leaving them feel like they're a shattered vase on a glass floor? It can be very disheartening in the job market because a lot of what you face is no's, way more than yeses. And for, again, sales, they're used to that in some ways, but not everyone in life is. So really what people want to know is the real reason. They want to get quick and relevant feedback. And that, even when it's not what they want to hear, I think is the best way to give them closure on a role. It's like, hey, the manager liked your background but you didn't have this piece and other people did, unfortunately. They can relate to that because they see where their shortfall was and then they know an area that they could come up to get there in the future. Fantastic. So Nick, if I was an aspiring young person who wanted to get into the world of tech, either in sales, marketing or other, what one piece of advice would you give them today? I would say, you know, network to your heart's content. Don't be scared to, to put your face out there in, in terms of relevant people. Obviously, don't become a pest when you're doing this. And certification, I think that's a big thing as well that more and more organizations start to look for. So relevant cybersecurity certifications, go to relevant forums, go to relevant trade shows now that we can, so like Infosec or Black Hat, um, attend those and be visible in the marketplace. That's the biggest thing. Cybersecurity is all about visibility when it comes to talent and, and knowing the right people to speak to at the right time. Okay, that's great. That's really good. Industry experience, exposure, all great. Not so great if you're a starving artist getting paid in exposure, but being exposed to the world of IT, great. So different question for you, Brandon. What one thing do you know today you wish you knew at the start of your career? I know Nick and I have talked a lot about networking, but not just networking, people's willingness to help. Like neither of us would have been successful in recruiting if a lot of people didn't help us along the way. So reaching out to ask for help, realizing that people are generally good and want to do the right thing is kind of the one thing that I did a lot of, but I do wish I knew did more of because you never know what connection is going to really lead to something. Okay, great advice. Great advice. Keep your horizons open, help other people, and you never know which path life will take you. So thank you both for joining me today. We had some really insightful topics. 
You've given me some things to think of, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Robin. That was all for our episode today. I hope you've come away feeling a little more educated and empowered. In case you've forgotten, I'm Robin Johns, and you've been listening to Convergence by Cato Networks. Don't forget to hit subscribe, and I'll see you next time.